Good afternoon. My name is Earl Lewis, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Thomas C. Holt Distinguished University Professor of History, Afro-American and African Studies and Public Policy at the University of Michigan, where I also direct the Center for Social Solutions. On behalf of myself and my colleague, Dwight McBride, the president of the New School, we wanna welcome you to this third installment of the Academic Leadership Institute webinar series. We are really thrilled that you are with us today and we truly look forward to this, this discussion. ALI has a mission to increase the representation of rising leaders committed to issues of diversity, equity and inclusion in higher education. We also want to assist those who are on the path to becoming future presidents and provosts of major colleges, universities, and institutions. Our primary initiative is the annual ALI residential program, which occurs every summer. But as a complement to that program, we also hold a biannual webinar series. And today is one part of that effort. Today's webinar topic is leading in a time of uncertainty. When should the president invoke DE and I? For those of you who are joining us in the audience today, I also would ask that you take a few moments after the conclusion of today's program to fill out, fill out a survey that will be sent to you electronically by email. To lead our effort today, I want to welcome in a second here, Dr. Carol Henderson. She's a vice provost for diversity and inclusion, the chief diversity officer and advisor to the president of Emory University. And to all, thank you again for participating in this webinar series. You will find its final product on our website uh, in a few days, and including questions that will help prompt you as you think about what you hear and what you will learn. But without further ado, Carol, over to you. It's now your show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be able to moderate such a distinguished panel this afternoon. Um, this is a timely topic, given what's going on in our country, the fact that knowledge is now being criminalized in some places, uh, individuals are afraid to speak about social justice, uh, human rights uh, are, are being challenged if they bring up divisive topics uh, around race, class, and even gender, uh, and not to mention other identities as well, our moments in history. And so this topic is timely, and it's also one that I think anchors the work that we do in higher education to broaden and open up channels of knowledge. Um, what does it mean to lead in a time of uncertainty? What does it mean to be a president uh, in this moment and to lead in a time of uncertainty, but also one who is passionate and is committed to the principles and values of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And so to answer that question um, and to talk about their experiences as leaders, uh, the partnerships they have with those who do DEI um, on, the, uh, on the campuses in which they lead, our, our wonderful presidents, um, President Mildred Garcia, President Mary Hinton, as well as President Marvin Kisloff. Uh, and it is an honor to be with you this afternoon. So I'm gonna start with the first question. I'm one of those to get right into it. I know we normally typically introduce our panelists, but I want them to introduce themselves. They can speak for themselves well. And so if you will, this is the first question uh, and I'll start with uh, President Mildred Garcia uh, and then President Hinton and then President Kislov. If you could introduce yourself, Describe the institution and the communities you serve, because I think that's important. And given the, the diversity on this panel will be very illuminating to those who are here. So President Garcia. Thank you so much. It's an honor being here. Let me begin by saying my name is Millie Garcia. I am the president of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities after being a three-time president. I started when I was five. Uh, and so, 
I will share with you that it's an organization that serves approximately 400 state regional comprehensive universities that serve the first generation, the low income, students of color and adults in their majority to the bachelor's degree and beyond. It is a presidential organization and we help presidents and teams learn how to navigate during these uncertain times. And we have been focusing on diversity, equity and inclusion since I became president three and a half years ago. And so I am honored to be with my panelists. And I, by the way, I'm a first generation college student, a New Yorkerican from Brooklyn, New York. Love that, love that. First gen, uh, definitely, and representing your space and place. So thank you so much, President Garcia. And if it's okay, once we've introduced ourselves, if, if you all will allow me the opportunity and we can speak on a first name basis just Please. for this space, uh, I would appreciate that. So sure, President Hinton. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by just thanking you, Carol, my fellow panelists, Earl and Dwight for this opportunity. I am delighted to be with all of you and to engage in a robust conversation about this critically important part of our work. I am Mary Dana Hinton. I am the very proud 13th president of Holland University located in Southwest Virginia in Roanoke. This is my second presidency. I'm president emerita of the College of St. Benedict in St. Joseph, Minnesota. Like Millie, I am a proud first generation college student. Um, and I, when I introduce our institution, I'll talk a bit about how that has shaped my leadership and my perspective on the issue of DEI. I think growing up poor, black in rural North Carolina has fashioned my leadership in some critically important ways that I think will surface organically in our conversation. So Carol, I look back to swinging back around and sharing a bit about Hollins. That's gonna be wonderful. President Kislaw. So my name is Marvin Krislaw and I'm president of Pace University. Um, we are a three campus private institution in New York, around 13,000 students. And uh, in the Raj Chetty study of upward mobility, we were ranked the number one private. Um, and that was frankly, one of the key reasons why I came to Pace. I had been the president of Oberlin College uh, for 10 years. And before that, I worked with Earl at the University of Michigan. So it's great to see all the, the Go Blues on, on this call as well. Um, I, I will just say that although I'm not first gen, my parents were first gen and I always grew up very aware of the opportunities my parents had afforded me. And uh, Pace University does exactly that. Um, about 50% uh, of our students are first in their family. Um, and close to half of our students also are um, identifying as students of color and about a third are Cal. So that's very much a part of our mission. And uh, I'm very happy to be on this panel to talk about um, the things that we all work on, which is to try to make our institutions more equitable and fair um, in a society that always isn't, that isn't always, I should say. Indeed. So let's circle back around. I think that we've described ourselves and the institutions we have. And one of the things in this next question, if you can define what diversity, equity, and inclusion means for your space uh, and connect that to the institution you serve, so that will give us a little uh, insight into that, especially given the rich dimensions of those communities. So I'll start with President Hinton. Mary, I will remember to say, Mary, you tell the way I was raised, so I will refer back to the first name. Go ahead, Mary. I think everything we say today is said in love, so no worries at all. Um, so let me start with a bit about Hollins, and, and I'll end with a DEI focus that we have. So Hollins was founded in 1842, which makes it one of the oldest women's colleges in Virginia and one of the oldest women's colleges in the nation. At the undergraduate level, we are an all a women's college, so we have co-educational graduate programs and have since uh, the 1960s. While Hollins was founded uh, based on this very progressive at the time idea that women deserved a robust liberal arts education, that premise, and that premise still enlivens us today, but that premise of course did not include all women. It did not include women of color. It did not include low income women either. 
In fact, Hollins was built by the work of the enslaved and many of our earliest community members had enslaved people at their service. And so that has a big shaping force when I think about Hollins University. And I'm privileged and honored to say that there are employees at Hollins today who descend from the enslaved who helped us to build this institution. Hollins, as I mentioned, is located in Roanoke, Virginia. It's the Southwest corner of Virginia, a diverse small city. But Hollins has never actively been a part of the local community beyond the fine art scene. And to me, it feels at times like there was some pride taken in not being an active partner with the community outside of the fine arts. And for well over a century and a quarter, that is who Hollins was. Hollins welcomed its first African-American student in 1966. So many of the people on my board, alumni, major donors, and local community members experienced a very different Hollins than the institution of today. Today, about a third of our students are American students of color, um, slightly less than 40% are Pell eligible, and another third are first generation. And in fact, since 2017, the first gen number alone has nearly doubled. doubled. So I'm very, very proud of what Hollins is today and who we are becoming. And we are actively working on DEI, which has a very unique posture in the South in a rural area at an institution that's 180 years old. And we've made some wonderful strides, but I will be clear that there is a cost attached to those strides. Um, I think that while you can generally get everyone to agree to the basic premise of inclusion, when it begins to impact their own self-understanding, worldview, deeply held beliefs, when, when the historical voice is not the only voice at the table, you run into challenges as a leader. So for example, we're going through a building renaming process using an incredibly thoughtful strategy, but I have certainly heard if you don't like Hollins as it is, then you shouldn't be there. So that's just the reality of, of institutions today and we're not alone in that. And let me be clear, I think the preponderance of people agree with our direction. We recently had an alumna donate $75 million. She did so in support of current students and the current vision. However, you still hear the coded and at times not coded negative voices. And the question becomes, how will you respond to that? And how does it shape your leadership commitments? And I will just end with, with one thing because it's relevant to someone else on this call. Very early on as a college president, so when I was still in Minnesota, I recall a conversation when I asked Earl Lewis how, as a leader, does one separate their own stories and identities from their leadership role? And Earl gave me very wise counsel, essentially saying that you can't. And so I know that my experience in the world as a Black woman from the rural South in a low-income family not only shaped who I am and how I see the world, but also how I lead. And I'm happy to come back and expound on that a bit more, but but and I allow my, my fellow panelists to get a word in as well. Thank you for that, Mary. And, and, and so many nuggets there that we'll uh, um, kind of sess out as we continue our conversation. Um, Marvin, because you're at PACE and I know what your mission is, how do you reflect on some of the nuggets that were in the comments just made? So I think that we are all influenced by our history, uh, both our personal history and our institutional history and our country's history. Um, and I think most of us are gonna look at history critically uh, given where we are and, and what we think about social justice. Pace's history is, is not bad. In fact, it was started as a, a school for training people for accounting and it was inclusive. It was not as inclusive as it is today. Um, but it was gender inclusive and race and across races and ethnicities, although I don't know that the representation was um, perhaps what it should have been. I, I don't really know um, all those numbers. But what I'd say is that we've worked very hard to make sure that PACE is becoming the kind of institution that we want to be proud of. And um, we've hired a spectacular um, chief diversity officer, but I, my, my mantra is Diversity, inclusion, social justice is everyone's work um, and um, that it is part of the mission of every single person at the institution. And 
to that end, we have looked at our hiring practices, both uh, for faculty and staff. Um, we have looked at our admissions practices, and I think that we have made significant progress, although I will say there's still more work to be done, particularly I think um, faculty diversity is not is not where it should be. And I think, and that's been a discussion in, on the strategic plan level, and I think is widely accepted. But even beyond that, I think we need to look at um, the curriculum. We need to look at um, the support we're giving students. Um, and I know that, for instance, um, mental health and well being is an issue that is critically important for many students. And I was on the Steve Fund Task Force on how the pandemic has affected students of color. And that's something that we're really paying attention to. And we've beefed up our, our counseling services. So I, I don't know that Mary and I have some of, have exactly the same challenges, but I'll say that I grew up in Kentucky actually. So I am somewhat familiar with, with the South and I was a Jew in the South and that was not always an easy experience either. Um, but uh, I think the history of race obviously stands apart. Um, um, for many other experience in this country. But um, I will say that it's a, a never ending job. And it's something that we talk about at the board level, we talk about in, in community conversations. And I will say that I'm very proud of, of the community because I think we all recognize that it's something that we need to be focused on and we're gonna always need to be um, trying to question ourselves and get feedback um, on whether we're doing things well, and um, so I, I consider it, it it's part of the journey, and I think it's a very exciting part of the journey for me. Thank you so much, Marvin. And, and so I'm going to turn to Millie, who has been president and now leads an organization um, that whose outreach helps individuals navigate the complexities of the climate and the culture we're in right now. And given your vast experience and your world, your uh, wisdom here. What do you see uh, and the tensions, and you can respond to what has already been stated, but I'm going to move us along with our questions because this time goes up, goes so quickly. What are the tensions you see in communities you serve, the intergenerational compositions of those? How do you help the various organizations that you lead as president and have led as president navigate these um, complex roles? And then how do you maintain your integrity and in who you are as an individual in light of that? I think Mary has spoken to that. Marvin has spoken to what it is to be Jewish in the South. And Mary as a Black woman um, in the South. And, and I know myself having come from Los Angeles, uh, South Central Los Angeles, but it wasn't a South South. I'm learning uh, what that looks like now. And knowing you, Millie, you, you have led uh, on the West Coast in a very vibrant and diverse community. How do you respond to those uh, questions? So, so let me begin by saying, if, you know, ASCU is representing institutions from across the country. And we had to do some internal work in the organization when I came in to understand the amazing, wonderful diversity and demography that has changed this country. So we had to do our own work. We came up with a strategic plan where student success and DEI is at the center of everything we do. And so as an organization, we started to think about how do we help presidents and their teams to navigate during these really difficult times. I have had presidents calling me who have had threats to their lives and threats to their children. I have had provosts buying guns because they're afraid to be in the neighborhoods in which they have now chosen to work. And so we start to have conversations, A, how to support them individually, as well as at every conference we have. We have a keynote speaker and break up into conversations on how to lead as a leader in having tough conversations with civil discourse and having skilled candor and having those conversations. So every, everyone from Michael Eric Dyson, and we just had Hannah, jo uh, Hannah Jones right, uh, talk to us and speak to us about what her experience was and not being tenured at her alma mater and what that meant. In addition to that is having presidents understand in their teams, who's in their neighborhoods? Who are those students? Where do they come from? What is their language? How do they speak? And finally, just this week, we had a symposium, thank God in person, 
were provosts from MSIs, HBCUs, anapesies to talk about what they are going through and speaking really on the center of democracy and diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. And so they become cohorts that support each other as they move forward. My, I am real clear in who I am. And so, I, as I said, I'm a first generation college student, come from the housing projects in Brooklyn, grew up in a very diverse neighborhood with every ethnicity you could think of. And quite frankly, that is the lens through which I see, see the world. And so it's really knowing how to navigate those conversations, sometimes using the language of the other to capture the person and have them listen to you. Thank you for that, Millie. I, I, and, and I'm glad you mentioned language. This is a wonderful segue. Um, such rich um, conversation here. And the fact that we can be vulnerable and authentic in who we are and still lead with a heart for the people and lead with the common ground values as the core and pinnacle of the work that we do. Knowing that higher education is still one of the few mechanisms used for social mobility in this country, and it's even more important now than ever. Um, the fact that we're still saying first gen in 2021 tells us that there is much work to do, not who we are, but the fact that we have students coming in the door who are still first gen, who are looking for the opportunity of education. So let's go back to this idea of language. Um, which is now becoming criminalized. It's a it's a it's a uh, linchpin of of tension and dissension. We have laws being created around the country to tell us what we can and cannot do in classrooms. And for those who are in public institutions, is even more tenuous than those who are in private institutions. So let's talk about language. D E I. CRT, critical race theory, I'm going to say that out, social justice, human justice. Has DEI become a bad word? How do you lead under these conditions? Uh, let me start with Marvin, and then I'll go to Millie and then Mary. So thank you for that question. I think that DEI is actually becoming very much part of the language of, of all the contexts that, that I operate in, whether it's government or the private sector or education and so forth. I think that people accept the notion and in fact value the notion that we should all come together and learn from each other. I think that social justice is something that sometimes um, can become more, more challenging for some people. I think though, for those of us on institutional campuses, on, on educational campuses, um, social justice is very much a part of what our students and our faculty and staff believe that they should be working on and that we should support that, that work as well. And, you know, I will say that there are different audiences um, and, and one has to be mindful, as Millie has said, of, of who you're speaking with, but I, I talk about DEI, it's front and center in our strategic plan. Um, we talk about social justice, uh, front and center. Um, we talk about anti-racism, uh, front and center. So I think that, um, and, and I and my colleagues are prepared to talk about what that means and to answer questions if people interrogate what those terms mean on our campus. And I think that if one is prepared to answer what that really means, and what the practices are, I think that that for the most part, um, there's general acceptance of that. Thank you, Millie. I, I agree with Marvin in that it is more accepted than we just hear the, the noise, right? But it is more accepted. And for us, it's about education. It's about presidents using their bully pulpit to speak out not only to the higher ed community, but in op-eds and in communities in their language and in their space. We, you know, we speak about our communities as if it's homogeneous, you know, and having served in California and served in New York as a president, you learn that there are many communities, some of them, their first language may be Vietnamese, maybe Spanish. And how do you get into those communities for them to understand, A, it's a place for them and for them to understand DEI 
and understand social justice. So they become advocates and warriors in what we need to do. Uh, quite frankly, you know, the question to me gives me a, a pull back because I, I, we allow sometimes for others to hijack our language when our language is so important to our communities, our states and our nation. Thank you for that. And, and I, let me just say, as before Mary comes um, to sp speak her truth, if you have questions, I know this conversation is, is getting everyone uh, to the place where you wanna ask questions. So please do use the Q&A function and they'll get those questions to us so that in our, uh, it, when we get to that portion of the program, we'll be able to address those questions. Mary? Yeah, thank you. So I, I think diversity is a word that people can hear. I think inclusion is a word people hear but don't always understand what it means. I will say that, you know, I have received the most pushback around the E in DEI, and that's not just in my own community. There's some national data, and I don't, I was looking for it, but I don't have it in front of me, but Deborah Humphreys at the Lumina Foundation shared some national data that shows um, how polarizing the word equity is, which I just find, I find that unbelievable. Like, how is equity a polarizing word? But there's some data that suggests that. And I live in the state of Virginia and in Virginia on our new governor's first day, he signed an executive order creating a tip line for families to email or call in if divisive concepts were taught in schools. And this right now is limited to the K-12 arena. So I think the phrase, I can't believe I'm saying this in 2022, it, it's become fraught for terrible reasons. If we can't teach uncomfortable or even divisive concepts in higher education, what in the world are we doing? I mean, that goes against every principle of the liberal arts. And when did recognizing and valuing the humanity of all people become a divisive concept? So I get lost in that in a, in a lot of places, but that is real. I see a, there's a comfort with changing equity to belonging. And I think belonging is critically important. So I don't have an issue with using the language of belonging, but I do think it's important for communities to ask why is there comfort with belonging and not comfort with equity? I think, um, you know, certainly critical race theory is a, is a char is charged language, um, but even just the straightforward teaching of history has become charged. So what are we called to do using our platforms? And I will tell you that as, as a black female president for some, every issue I speak about becomes a DEI issue. It matters not what I'm talking about. Just when I show up in the room because of expectations that people have about me, my leadership, my intellect, no matter what I say, it becomes for them an issue of DEI. So I can say some pretty milk toast things about some pretty un inconsequential topics. And I did that once and was accused, I guess, as if it's a bad thing of promoting CRT. And, and so I'm not sure why equity or divisive concepts would be an affront to the academy. I think we should be leaning into those ideas, but I will say in some areas and not just in Southwest Virginia, um, it has become a big, big issue. And my heart is extended to my colleagues and public higher ed here in Virginia in particular, in particular and across the nation. So that let's, let's talk about the politicization of, of, of uh, of language and the fact that DEI is now collapsed with critical race theory when those who are in higher education know they have a kinship, but they are definitely distinct units of, of engagement and philosophical thought. Now that DEI, so that I can say critical race theory, um, anything that has to do with CRT is diversity, equity, inclusion, but we also have laws that are now being created to say you can't teach about slavery. You can't, you know, don't talk about the Holocaust. I mean, that may be divisive. So the do you feel that the politicization of language now heightens the urgency of the work of DEI? And how do you lead? Um, how do you um, encourage those who are under your supervision or who are looking for your guidance as a leader to continue to stand firm during that work in ways that build bridges and not 
walls. Um, Millie. Yeah, that's a really good question because as we work with a state colleges and universities where they can't, what our organization does is that we speak for them and we look for coalitions to continue. So this, there's six organizations represent all of higher ed. We work together to push the agenda because we know they can't. Because if they do, then they're without a presidency. But yet they're doing the internal work without being so public. So we need them there in every state to continue the work of DEI, maybe not as vocal as some of us can be, but then it is up to us as partners and allies and supporters to help them through that and pro provide them the language that would keep them out of trouble. And so that's why we say you have to stay strong. You're doing good work because they are doing good work on the, these campuses, but yet they realize that they are in a very tenuous situation. Very tenuous. I'm going to, to ask a more direct question along with that. So I, I wonder if you all as presidents and having served as presidents and are in your very unique uh, roles, and let me say, we thank you for the work that you do and your service. I know it can be a thankless job um, as a leader, um, being a translational leader, trying to translate the D and DEI and our social justice principles into the educational mission in ways that bring more people along um, and, and understanding that transformational leadership may be provocative, thought provoking and may get people pa cause for pause. Um, and, and this group I know is beyond the transactional part of leadership where you're just checking the box. So I appreciate what you all do. Can you describe a scenario? And I think this will be helpful for those who are in the audience where you led, managed, or thought through a controversial high profile. And we're using the term DEI um, as, a, as a metaphor for, a, 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 a for an incident that may have had been racially charged um, or otherwise, uh, other um, identities connected to that in the profile. How have you, how did you manage that? How did you lead through that high profile crisis. And I think that changes it when we use the word crisis for that. So I'm going to start with Millie and then move to Marvin uh, and, uh, and Mary, I mean, Mary and then move to Marvin and then Millie thinking of your dual roles um, to comment on that. You want me to go first or you want Mary to go first? Who, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to be talking. Let me start with Mary and then I'll move to Marvin and then Millie. Apologize yeah. for that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, so before I give specific incidents, I want to pick up on one particular thing you said, Carol, that I often talk with college presidents about, and there's a question in the Q&A where, where I hope this person hears this response. Um, you know, so often when students are protesting on our campuses, we treat them as a crisis moment. And we think about how do we get the protest to stop? How do we get the protest to end? And it becomes... We just say the right thing. We, we treat it as a crisis. So there's a part of me that really pushes back against treating um, DEI issues and student protests as crises. Because when we do that, once the crisis has ended, then we don't continue to do the work. And so if we think about those protests, I truly view them and the um, issue that immediately came to mind was January 17th in response to the inauguration of our former president. There was a big student protest on our campus. Um, and I was at St. Ben's at the time. You know, what those students were saying was, we deserve better, more, we deserve to be heard. Our country deserves, needs to acknowledge the value and worth of all human beings. So why would we hear that as a crisis as opposed to a call to action? So I think whenever we are in those situations when something erupts on campus, I think the first job of the leader is to be present, to listen, and to try to hear what is at the core of it. It's not necessarily to diffuse. Now, of course, if there's acts of physical violence, that's a different thing, but that's never been my experience. Students want to be heard and they're trying to use their voice in the best ways that they can. 
So I think you have to be there in your full humanity and as the leader, but in, I put them in that particular order, human and then leader. Um, and I think you have to be willing to show that you are moved and to be moved, if you're not moved, don't try to fake it. But if you can hear the pleas of students and not be moved, it's probably not the right role for you. Um, you know, speaking out in 2020, uh, um, particularly in April about Ahmaud Arbery and then May with George Floyd and all of the other items, I mean, that sparked quite, quite a bit of backlash. Building renaming is sparking some, not a lot, but some backlash. And you have to keep your focus. I think the reason why I start with Holland's mission is you always have to go back to that mission as your starting point. I have an obligation to speak out and respond to these matters because we were founded on the premise of equity. And while some people didn't think that extended to other categories of people, that was our founding premise. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. Um, and I'm grateful for organizations like ASCU, NICU, AAC, and you and others that help sustain presidents when they have to say that because there's more than one who's lost their job speaking out. And ultimately speaking out about DEI is at its base speaking out about the humanity of others. And you can't politicize one's humanity. People deserve to exist, be heard, and to feel their full work. Powerful. Marvin, that's all I can say with that. It's powerful. Move. Let me, yeah, I don't add to that. Let the next person speak. You're mute. You're mute, Marvin. Oops. You'd think after all this time, I would know how to unmute. Um, anyway, thank you for that, Mary. Um, I will speak about a specific incident, but I'm going to be fairly general um, because for obvious reasons. Um, but shortly after I arrived at Pace, there were allegations of racism in a particular program um, against a faculty member, although there were generalized uh, concerns expressed as well. And of course, in any situation like this, you have to pay attention to the due process and the rights of, of the faculty or the staff members as well as do exactly what Mary said, which is listen to the students or those who felt that they had been mistreated. And some of the allegations went back many years. Some of them were a little unclear. Um, and what we did was we, we did two different types of things. We did some, um, we did an investigation about the particular individual or individuals, but we also looked at the more systemic issues um, and that involved uh, curricula, it involved um, the way the program was structured, and we did in fact change leadership as well. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's hard work. And it's very, um, it's upsetting. Um, students were uh, quite, it was particularly alumni, recent alumni, and they use social media and they were quite um, active. And they said things about the provost who is um, uh, actually a woman of color and, and myself, as well as, as some of the faculty. And um, you know what we did was we observed the boundaries that you, you have to observe in terms of the individual faculty members or individual staff members who were at, 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 uh, at issue. Um, but we articulated principles, we articulated our desire to improve, and we invited the students in. Some of them did join in the effort, some of them chose not to, um, and that was complicated as I'm sure the people on this, this call have experienced. Um, and I will say that it was not uh, a particularly um, easy set of discussions over a couple of years. Um, we have we have moved on. I think we've shown good faith. I think we've made significant changes and I think we've treated people fairly. Now, have we done it in a way that makes everybody happy? I, I can't say that. Um, but what I can say is that we engaged and that meant that I and the provost met with the students 
um, uh, the chief diversity officer also was part of the discussion. And sometimes those were quite painful. And um, I'm sure that all of us on this call have had the experience of students getting very emotional and, and talking about how their lives were altered in a, in, a, in a terribly difficult way by actions that either the institution or individuals had. And I, I guess the only advice I can say is try to articulate as best you can what your guiding principles are, which in this case were um, a commitment to fairness um, to both individuals and, 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 and everyone in the community and a desire to improve and to desire to look at, at allegations or, or experiences as, as candidly and, and fairly as possible. And um, I'm sure all of us have had these experiences and there's, I, I will just say, and then I will, I will stop talking, Carol, because I know you're probably thinking, why is Marvin going on and on about this? Um, but um, I think that the times we live in, and I'm not the first person to say this, that is the sort of social media and the speed of needing a response has made it all the more challenging. Um, and I can certainly think of instances at, 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 at other institutions in addition to PACE where students and the social media create a demand for an answer right now. And we in academia like to think about things and we like to actually have the facts and we like to be convinced that we know what really happened or didn't happen. And in many, many instances, we don't have the luxury of doing that. So I think that um, going back to principles and trying to create processes that people feel are fair is very important. And sometimes that, that is extremely challenging, particularly in the timelines that, that our communities sometimes want responses on. So I'll stop there. Yes, I think I, I think both you and Mary are, are speak to um, important points. I'm glad you brought up social media because we hadn't put that in the question, but I think it's an important one connected to communication. When you think of a crisis moment, or as Mary thoughtfully said, a moment where we are being challenged and asked by our community to live up to our principles and values that we purport in, as part of the educational and institutional mission and how to navigate the various uh, constituency groups that have um, connection to that, whether it be alumni or parents or students or faculty or staff, um, all of those individuals who want to be heard I wanna let Millie speak to a particular incident um, and how uh, she helped navigate that. And Millie, you can do that either in your current role or in your previous role as well. You have insight into both of those. And then I wanna come back to that idea of communication. Yeah, I like to go back to my last year's president at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, if you know anything about uh, Cal State Fullerton, it is in Orange County. Uh, what, was, what was one of the whitest and most conservative counties in California. The institution had changed dramatically with students of color, uh, Latinos were 40% of the population, 15% Asian American, mostly Vietnamese. And then we've had students from all over the world. So Milo Yiannopoulos was invited. If you remember Milo Yiannopoulos, he was a, conservative guy who spoke against Islam, social justice, diversity, everything. And they followed the process. The college Republicans followed the process. On the other side, I had everybody that was totally against. And this is a campus that has over 40,000 students. And so of course I had the coalition fighting for don't allow him to come. Well, we are a public university and have to let him in. And I do believe in the free exchange of ideas civilly and to debate those ideas that's what universities are about. And then I had, of course, my, my student government and the com those communities that were against him telling me, what are you gonna do about this? And so it was about, and I loved what Mary said being, is your hum humanity first and then you're, you're a leader. And I went to all of the groups with my teams and all my deans to talk about why we must have this conversation involved the chair of the academic senate 
and the person in charge of the union chapter on our campus to talk about how we were gonna manage this without it being a catastrophe as it had been at UC Berkeley. And so what we did was go around to everyone and we, they, we started to talk to the, both groups. You could have it, they pay, they followed the process. And then the other group had a diversity festival protesting the guy on the campus. And so they were able to communicate, share their protests, be able to hear their voices. And it, I had to listen to both sides. And quite frankly, the students were fine. We had 12 arrests, one of them was a student. Everybody else was from off campus. It's a public university, it's open to Wonderful, thank you for that, Millie. And, and yes, Yiannopoulos, that name is consistent with controversy and uh, connection in that way. I, I remember those moments well. Um, we even navigated that on uh, at the University of Delaware. And when I was there and one of the, what our team did was there were two alum who knew he was coming to speak um, and was allowed to speak. And there was an auditorium of 700 and some odd seats. And we found out that it was sold out. And so we were trying to figure out how we were gonna navigate that. And what we found out was that there were two individuals, very wisely smart alum who reserved most of the tickets and then did not show up. And so the audience that was their sit in protest, it was brilliant, um, something I would not have thought to do. Um, and maybe there was a small audience, but it was not the audience that was expected. And so I think what, what, what that taught me, even in this role as a chief diversity officer, but also working with leadership is that we have to be innovative and creative in the ways in which we address that to get people to understand that, yes, there are going to be people at the table who will make us uncomfortable. We, we realize that there are boundaries to what disrespect looks like. Um, but those, I think, are the, the tenuous moments. How do we navigate? Uh, and and it, this may be a question for, for Marvin, because I know he has a JD, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but Marvin, I know you have a JD, so I'm, I'm just going to ask this question, you know, and ask all of you all to reflect on this, because one thing you spoke to social capital is you, Millie talked about going around to each of the groups and speaking, and Mary talked about allowing students room, but what do we do when humanity bumps up against law? What, what is the tension when the human experience, for example, free speech, which we know is, is a big topic now, uh, and one that we just spoke to, bumps up against a person feeling injured by that which is spoken. How do you all as presidents navigate that now? It, you know, it's, it leans into the inclusion part of the DEI paradigm. Um, and in ways that um, stretch us. And so I will start with Marvin, then I'll go to Millie and then Mary. So I will say that I think this is a time when these incidents are a time when we really have to lean into the notion of education and what is an educational institution doing? And Millie, it sounds like you handled that superbly, which I'm not surprised. Uh, by, um, I more at Oberlin than at Pace had some controversial speakers that were brought in, and I I am a very strong free speech uh, person, and that does come from my belief in the law and my also sense that um, the suppression of speech can lead to really harmful effects for our democracy. However there are ways to contextualize speech so that there are educational values um, in play, even if there's a controversial or, or abhorrent speaker. And so what I, I have tried to do when I've in these been in these situations is try to encourage faculty to have panels or efforts to explain the truth, or at least the truth as they know it and contextualize the hateful speech uh, for instance, if it was something about the Holocaust, to, to actually have information about that. And I've also tried to talk to students about what is the best way if they are uh, offended by what they think the speaker will say, um, what is the best way for them to protest, whether it is 
to, to pass out leaflets, to have alternative um, events, or whether to encourage people not to go. Now, having said that, I know that sometimes there are people who come to campuses or may wish to come to campuses that are so ab ab abhorrent that it's, it's very hard to, to keep these norms. Um, but I, I really think that unless there is a real threat to life and safety, that it's very important for us to try to keep the educational mission. What I try to do in my own teaching is to try to present alternative views and to try to create fora where people can hear those alternative views and sometimes even assigning role play. And I, I, I just think that that's something that we as educators have to, to lean into. Um, and I know it, it can be very, very hard. Um, Thank you, Marvin. Millie? I agree with Marvin in the education. It's extremely important. And everything he said, I, I agree with and have been doing. Uh, one of the things we do at ASCU is try to have both sides of the argument at our annual meetings and our conferences. You know, uh, when I came in, one of the critiques of ASCU was that we were too one-sided. And so I make it a point that at every conference, we are role modeling for all how we do that. In addition to that, when I was president, like Marvin, I'm a free speech person. I think I'd rather know what you're gonna say and know what you're thinking and be able to talk about that. But I also think this is, as a person, I try to listen to the silences to those who have been hurt. So for example, when Trump was saying all those awful things, we had the, we have opened the first Dreamer Center in, at the California State System on our campus. We had over 700 students. And when he, we didn't know what was going on and they were freaking out. They weren't protesting, they weren't saying anything, but we have to listen to the silences and be able to go to them and listen to their hurt and let them know that you are going mm -hmm. to help them through the process, even though legally they can say whatever they want, but that you as a person are there to support and listen to them and find ways for them to navigate that pain and that hurt. I think that's, I, if, if we don't take anything away from here today, which we're gonna take a lot because there's been wonderful things said, that is such an important point to validate the feelings of those who have been impacted or hurt and walk them through that process. We're in that moment now where people are being hurt not only on our campus, but outside of our campus in other communities. And some of that they bring with them to our campus and they have nowhere to put that and how to navigate that and things become compounded. And so for that's, I, Marvin mentioned this early, when we talk about wellness and the, in the sense of belonging, all of that is a part of that, whether that's emotional, intellectual, cultural uh, traditions, all of that is part of people being allowed under the auspices of diversity, equity, and inclusion and all of their intersectional identities to bring their whole selves with them where they are um, uh, and to grow and to be healed and, and and um, encouraged to flourish in that regard. So thank you both, Mary. Yeah, what's been said is just lovely. Um, I will only add to two things, I think. As we know that we need to and must protect freedom of expression, I do think we want to pause for a moment and be as vigilant in exploring who bears the burden of that free speech? Because I think that's really important for us to talk about. Um, and I think it, it's becoming more so. So who tends to be harmed consistently by others' rights? I think we just wanna to acknowledge that to our students and let them know that we hear that pain um, that they're experiencing. And sometimes it's an external speaker. Sometimes it's the consistent microaggressions in the classroom. And I think another part of speech that we want to be very attuned to is when students tell us their experience or tell others on our campus their experience, and we, we question that or we deny it or we tell them to reframe it. Well, if they're sharing their hurt that's happened on our campuses, and I don't know a campus that would be immune from this, 
um, then we need to take that seriously and hear that and not re not reframe it. We educate, certainly that is what we do, but we need to hear it and not reframe it. I also want to go back to something that Millie said that I think is so, so important, which is listen to the silence. You know, I, I'm always fascinated by the various surveys that presidents get to participate in and how many presidents say, things are great on their campus as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I have a lot of questions about that, but if you think it's great because there's silence, then I think there's probably a really big problem that that silence is hiding for you. Um, if people aren't comfortable enough to bring concerns to raise these central questions that we should be wrestling with, then I think that's its own problem. So we need to pay attention to that silence from our students. We need to pay attention to that silence. What aren't we hearing from staff? We need to pay attention to silence in the curriculum, what's not being taught and why. So I just wanna echo what Millie said about listening to that silence. Agreed, silence is its own language. Um, and sometimes that language is more powerful than those words that are coming out because language is not adequate enough to capture the depth of the pain or the feeling there. So very much, uh, I'm glad you echoed that because that's what I was writing down on my card. I'll have to remember that, listen to the silence. And it's something um, many uh, powerful activists, including those sitting in this room have stated. I, I, I wanna, I know questions are going to come to me soon and looking forward to that. And I have a couple more questions. We can talk about social media and how you navigate social media around DEI at this particular moment. That might be the question. I wanna re return to that one. Um, and how do you help faculty, staff, and students with that? Because I've seen a comment, a faculty um, member will, will go, get into verbal discussion with the student on social media and then it, it, it mushrooms into an issue that becomes an institutional issue um, or it becomes, uh, it, it's moved outside of the context of how that conversation started and then becomes a catch all for all of the ills and hurts that are going on, on an inst at an institution. We know death by a thousand cuts and it's used at a thousand and one that will be the one that will trigger something. Um, so Millie, let me start with you. How do you help, uh, how did you help and how do you help presidents navigate social media uh, in this moment as it relates to DEI and the uncertainty, the moments we're in? Because I think that's, I wanna bring that word back up again. We, you know, what is it to lead in this moment of uncertainty, um, which um, is quite, challenging and can offer some opportunities for transformation. At ASCQ, we absolutely bring in professionals because one of the mistakes that is made by early career presidents is they answer everything. And you can't answer everything. And you have to be very careful on what you are saying. Not that you're going against your values, but words matter, language matters and how you speak about an issue will follow you. So we are sure to bring in not only individuals who are communication experts, but presidents who have learned how to navigate that and how they do that well. And also learn from the presidents that are very open, that share the mistakes they've made and what they've learned from being uh, so out there and not thinking through. I will tell you that I'm one of the first persons to tell you that in the beginning, when I see some of these things, I'm the first one that wants to go out and be angry. And you're gonna to have to pull back and think through, and what is the purpose of the social media? And it, why are you doing it? For me now, it's about education. It's about stating the facts. It's about speaking about the importance of DEI and being very careful to follow that line as a leader, because you are representing not only yourself, which is always included in the thought process, but also the organization or institution and the students you serve. Yes, indeed. Marvin, Mary, do you have any comments to that? Go ahead, Mary. 
Uh, well, I, I was going to say that I, I was struck by the, the idea of silences. And um, I think that I was just thinking, this is a little perhaps off topic, but I was just thinking about what happened, has been happening in the Ukraine and that a lot of presidents have been making comments about the Ukraine and um, obviously comments about many other instances over the last couple of years. And I think one needs to figure out what are the things that one really wants to speak on, that what is important for the institution and know that, that not everyone may agree with the statements. Um, and I, I think that it's a, it's, it's, it's a personal judgment, but it has to be informed by the institutional considerations as well. And, you know, sometimes I think people want presidents to speak because they feel that that validates their viewpoints. And sometimes that is really important. Sometimes it's not, I don't think in the institutional leaders um, I don't think it's necessarily wise. Um, and I don't know that there's a clear guideline when, when it is and when it isn't. But I think that this is where having a team of people that you can assemble um, to say what's very important for the community to hear, what's an important topic, but maybe not one for the president or the provost or whomever to speak on. And, and we need to be able to be pretty blunt with each other about what's important. And, and at times there are gonna be things that Mary or Millie and I may feel differently about as presidents. And you know, I may say for my community, I need to say something about Ukraine, which I did. Um, there's some presidents who probably didn't. Um, and you know, similarly, I mean, I think virtually every president did speak about the George Floyd murder. Um, I think there are, are other instances. In, in New York, I think I spoke about anti-Asian violence because it's right in, in our neighborhood. Um, but there are other issues of great concern that I am passionate about that I did not feel it was appropriate for me to speak about as president. And all I can say is that's where you have to have people around you who can help guide you because I, I don't know if this is what you wanted to get at, Carol, but I will tell you that, you know, there are particularly in these times, there's almost every day that there's something that we could be talking about, some new outrageous behavior of some sort. And, and I think you just have to strike a balance and figure out where your priorities are. And, you know, we all do our best and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. Agreed. Yes. And statements are often, I think you're right, people feel validated and seen when, when, they see those statements, but statements have to be followed with action. And yes. so that's what the social capital building is about. So that um, if you built relationships with communities on your campus, they'll know how you feel about them. Um, and the statement, while an outward manifestation of that, they will also know that if there isn't a statement, I am still seen and heard and validated in that role. Uh, Mary? Now, I would echo what everyone has said. I'm not, I don't have a big social media presence. My institution has a social media presence. It's just not something I think for some of the harms that it can do to young women um, in particular, what we're learning with the research. I do think in those moments when we are called to speak, there are just some things you have to speak on. You just won't sleep until you do. And as yeah. Marvin said, there are other times when it, I may not sleep, but I, if I can't connect it directly enough to my mission, I may not speak on it. I also think we want to recognize, particularly now, that presidents get to be human beings too. And sometimes I, there's a Martin Luther King, I'm not going to be able to quote it, but he says in letter from a Birmingham jail, um, you know, that he's living through this, even as he fights it. And mm -hmm. for some of us, we are living through these moments. I, I, we get to have emotions too. Now we have to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and shepherd that community 
But I think it's important. I remember um, when there was a killing of Dante Wright last year, my note to my community was, I can't, I don't have anything to say because I'm too hurt. I'm, and I think we have to share that. I think part of that is the vulnerability. If it's authentic, I keep coming back to that word. I think sometimes people perform on social media and that's not helpful. And I think that can destroy your credibility with your community. Um, but if you are authentically moved, I think your community gets deserves to see you as a human being as well as a leader. Powerful. Yes, indeed. I remember that well. And people respond to that. You know, when I think of all that we're talking about, when, when we think of diversity, equity, inclusion, diversity being intersectional identities and when we think of equity, that everyone should have an equal chance at life and the pursuit of happiness and all that comes with it. And when I think of inclusion, that you invite people to the table, but also give them a plate to sit down and eat and a, time, you know, a chance to determine what the menu is and actually speak. All of those things, the action, um, the authenticity of who we are as people guides that work and, and begins to build the bridges of our humanity. I, I, that's the fabric. When we think of the beloved community, that is what is so key to what we um, hope that this conversation today will encourage. Um, I know we're coming up close to the end and I know I will get questions, but I'm gonna ask, we're gonna do a 90 second kind of flash of pearls of wisdom. I'm gonna start with um, Melly and then move to Mary and then Marvin. Just on this, on this topic, the lessons you've learned, what are some pearls of wisdom? And you may have one or two and it may come up again in, in the question and answer as I uh, get connected to those. But what are your pearls of wisdom for those who took time out of their busy schedule today to come and listen to us engage in this conversation, those, and I appreciate you for that. So I learned a long time ago, know thyself, know your blind spots, know your biases. And in Paulo Freire's work, always have a have hope because without hope we can't continue in the struggle. Thank you. I, we knew Millie was going to drop the mic on hers. So uh, Marvin, Mary. You know, I would I would agree with that. I think it is critically important for leaders to know what their personal mission in this life is. What is their North Star? because you will find yourself in high stakes situations on campus and off when you have to make determinations about your fidelity to your mission. You have to make determinations about how you'll use your platform. You have to navigate spaces that are sometimes both harmful and generative. And you have to do that while still running this enterprise. And so my hopeful, my words, I don't, won't claim pearls of wisdom, but my words are, I sometimes have to take a step back, center myself around Mary Dana Hinton's mission. What am I called to do and do a calculation? I ask, am I holding myself to the same standard I would hold my students? Would my students be proud of me right now? How will the next words I utter impact my soul? How will they impact my integrity? How will they impact my institution? And I ask myself, am I using my platform for equity, which is my mission, or am I performing on the platform? And I think every person needs that mission, their own mission front of mind, and be prepared to respond when the answers to those questions I just outlined yield an intolerable answer, because you will need to ask yourself those questions quite often. Thank you, Marvin. So I don't know if these are pearls or, or maybe or maybe nickel plated jewelry, um, but uh, I I am constantly reminded of the importance of listening to students and faculty and staff in a more informal setting, and I learn things that way. I think I can get. I, I develop relationships and trust. And um, I think that 
we sometimes underestimate how much distance there may be perceived between us as leaders and staff or faculty or students. And um, I think the things we can do to shorten that distance and really try to listen um, benefits both our leadership, but also I think the community. And every time I think I'm just so busy, I just don't have time to do these sorts of listening sessions, I come out of them and I say, oh my God, thank goodness I did it because I know, I mean, that's where I get my pearls in those sessions. Thank you for that. And, and I should say where I, why pearls are such a, a powerful metaphor because we know that pearls are wounds in a clam or muscle that grow and become this valuable thing that we have. And so as leaders, we all have our moments where we have been stung and wounded by the work that we do. And what we offer up to individuals are pearls of wisdom, wherever that is in your space. So thank you for sharing that. I have the questions. So one question is very provocative that I'm going to ask first. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, so we'll, everyone doesn't have to answer the questions, but whoever wants to answer, I think it'll be good so I can get through as many as I can. One says, can one really be a college president today without holding and advancing DEI as a central value and pillar? I think that's a provocative question. I wonder about the college presidents who remain outside of DEI, who aren't invested, haven't grown, don't see how they can survive as presidents. So that's the question. I, well, I, I will just say one quick thing about that. Every year on the various boards I serve on or conferences I attend, I say, we've got to do a session just for presidents because um, just because we, we may be smart and have these fancy titles doesn't mean we have done our own reconciliation work around DEI and what scares me um, is that you absolutely can be a president and be disconnected from DEI. And I think that does harm. I think it does harm to grievous harm to your students, to your community, to your faculty, to your staff, to your board, but you can be. And I think until presidents will say, I don't know this, or I'm willing to hear mm -hmm. this, or I'm willing to be uncomfortable with this, Mm -hmm. You have to say that. You got to sit in those spaces that Millie and Marvin talked about when you just have to take it and listen. And that's my pearl. If there's a wound standing in those spaces, you have to hear it, but it makes you a better person. You start to build that pearl. But a lot of people can absolutely foreclose that. They don't live in a world where it's, where it's meaningful to them. And that makes me sad for them and for all the rest of us. You know, just to piggyback on what Mary said, um, that's why we have someone talk about this to presidents at every meeting. And you can see, look, not mm -hmm. every president is where these wonderful panelists of colleagues of mine are at, but the conversations that they have with each other are critical. So when Ibram Kendi came and they started to say, they, you could see the uncomfortableness, but the conversations over the cocktail hour at the end, start, and when someone said, when Michael Eric Dyson came and he, someone said to a president, they were both presidents said, and it was a crowd, oh, he was cursing too much. And one president turned around and said, were you uncomfortable because he cursed or were you uncomfortable with the message he was sending? And so that confrontation when they're by themselves, they can have those conversations. And also they can let their hair down and not look like they are the president and able to say, I've heard presidents say, I am afraid to have these conversations because I'm afraid I'm gonna say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So they can be human, vulnerable be human. amongst themselves. Yes, yes, love that. Marvin, did you have anything to add? To yeah, that? I'll or just add, question? I think what, what Millie and Mary are saying is, is humility is really important. And I think particularly if you are listening to people whose life experiences may be dramatically different from yours, you need to be humble and, and understand and acknowledge that. The other thing is, I think there is a way to institutionalize the discussions that we're talking about, um, which is, and this advice was given to me by uh, a former colleague at Michigan, actually, but I think it can be adapted. 
um, which is to have a designated truth teller on the team and to have that person um, give that person permission to say, hey, Marvin, you're not really hearing this or you're not doing this or I think you need to meet so-and-so. And, -so. and um, I think that's true of many aspects, but I think in this particular realm, particularly if it's a president who may not have deep experience, I think she, he, they needs to have somebody that they give permission to, to speak very candidly and perhaps even critically to. Um, and I know that I've done that. And I think, I think I've grown as a, as a person and as a leader because of that. Thank you for that. So the next question, um, and because I see we have about 10 minutes. So there are two questions. One has to do with a board. How do you approach the intergenerational work of bringing, uh, uh, bridging how an older board of trustees may see DEI work and how the campus communities you lead see this work? <laughs> I almost didn't ask it because we're talking about board of trustees and I know board of trustees are the boss the president. So this could be a very, if, if you want to answer it, let me know. I'll move to the horizon question. <laughs> I'll, 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 take, like, I'll take a crack. I'll take okay, a crack. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, Millie and Mary, you can thank me for, for taking this one. <laughs> no, but I want, I want you all to join on. Our, our mission is Opportunitas. And um, one of the conversations I've had that I've most enjoyed with some of our board members is that while today's students may be different superficially, they have the same drive, the same ambition, the same background as you did. And, and this is what we're talking about. And I think trying to I find with many boards, board members, particularly because so many of them are alumni, that their experience of X institution is when they went and they were here. And well, we didn't have that. What's the big deal? Or we didn't do this and so forth. And I say, well, let's 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 talk about what's happening today, who the students are today, what their needs are today. Maybe you could even meet some of them. And then let's talk about how that experience is similar but different today. And I think, I think that you have to treat board members as human beings and understand where they're coming from and what their experience of X institution was and um, to help them feel safe and comfortable in learning, which is what we're, we're talking about, the recalcitrant board member. I, I'm just going to add real quick to that because I think he's absolutely right. A real quick example, uh, in Orange County, I shared with the board, the foundation board, that who was in the public schools in Orange County in P-12, in, in the, by diversity, by gender, by income. And mm. in California, you know, they are business people, they are appointed by the governor, and all of a sudden a light bulb went on as to who is in these communities and learning about what would happen. Then they went back and they found out that many of their employers were the parents of these children who are gonna be the workers, the leaders and everything else that's gonna happen in those communities. So it is about listening to them, but also educating them because yeah. they know. Yeah. I, I wanna just echo both, uh, both of my fellow panelists. Um, and I mentioned earlier that Hollins didn't integrate until 1966. I have a number of board members who graduated before that. And it is an educative process. And by and large, people want to learn. But you, will, you may have on your board some folks who don't know what DEI stands for. And you may have some who are way out far ahead of where you could even move your community to in, in a reasonable amount of time. So it is meeting folks where they are and educating them because when that board votes on your operating budget, they're voting on your commitments to DEI. And if you've not educated them about what's in there, um, then, then you've lost an opportunity. So if we're gonna invest in retention and persistence, and I'm big that if you accept a student, you've made a moral commitment to graduate them, and we know students have different sets of needs, then that, that operating budget becomes a tool to educate your board about what your students and your broader community need. 
Wonderful, wonderful. So if you could leave one word with our listeners, because we're coming towards the end. I think I keep giving my cue. You got five minutes. You got five minutes. Okay, I, I got it. <laughs> I'm going to tease her. Um, if you have one word to leave, and let me say before I ask for this, thank you, thank you, thank you. Marvin, thank you, Mary, thank you, Millie, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for the privilege and honor of allowing me to moderate such a panel with such a distinguished group of individuals. So I want to say that before we get off the air, uh, but want to say if there's one word you want to leave with people about DEI and the presidency, um, something that is a word of encouragement, a phrase, what would it be? I'll start with Millie. We need you desperately you. on our campuses. Thank you. The, the diversity is not where it should be, and we must diversify the presidency. Yes, yes. Marvin, Mel Mary? <laughs> I, I would leave with the word that my campus hears a lot and it's probably not appropriate I don't know but the word is love mm -hmm. you've got to approach the work and the labor of education as a labor of love and to me that makes all things possible um, it's the genesis of why I get up in the morning and so that would be my word is love Thank you. Beautiful. Marvin? I would just say that we're trying to build a community and a much better community than perhaps um, people have grown up in or even may enter. And that uh, it's, it's, it's good to be idealistic about learning and living together. And that's what we're trying to do. Wonderful. And I'll leave a word. Mine would be hopeful uh, and always remain there. Um, I will not acquiesce, give my hope to someone else. Um, and if I hold on to that, that will give me the perseverance to continue to lead. And so I want to end with a quote by Marian Wright Edelman that's in my signature that I love, and it really speaks to the work of DEI. Um, we often talk about inputs and outputs, what's going in, these are things we set goals, we wanna achieve those goals, but transformation occurs in the journey between the input and the output. And so I want to leave you with this quote by Marion Wright Edelman. We must not in trying to think about how we can make a big difference, ignore the small daily differences we can make, which over time add up to big differences we often cannot foresee. And if you look at all of us who are on this panel, someone poured into us hoping that it would generate great fruit. And I will say that it has, if I can speak to that. Um, so thank you for um, being with us this afternoon. And we wish you all the best in your journey ahead as you lead with conviction and lead engaged for impact.